Coming to you from Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, it's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Hey, this is going to be a fun show. I'll tell you what, it's like the Academy Awards and the Oscars, the Envelope Please 2024 National Plants of the Year. And Stacy, if we're going to talk about National Plants of the Year, I have to say right off the top, one of my favorite people, Megan Matai, the plant breeder here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, the hydrangea of the year, Let's Dance Skyview, reblooming hydrangea. Of course, we talked about that this past year. It's an amazing hydrangea for its ability not only to conserve its old wood buds in the face of, well, cold and wintry temperatures, but it's also its ability to continue creating new flowers. Uh, high praise for Megan for Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. And uh, boy, this is fantastic. Uh, 2024 National Plant of the Year Hydrangea Let's Dance Skyview Reblooming Hydrangea. It is such an incredible plant. And you know, it's so, it's so complex to tell the story of our newer Let's Dance Hydrangeas, like Let's Dance Skyview. Because what we have been doing, and I've talked about it on the show a couple times before, is really selecting for the ability for the hydrangea to set flower buds lower down on the stem. Yes. Old hydrangeas, they only set their flower buds at the tippy top. Now, those lower down flower buds, they don't just make the plant look better. They also get conserved if there is cold damage. And so Megan's team has been looking out and identifying plants with those characteristics and then using them to develop really fantastic plants like Let's Dance Skyview. And you really have to see the color to mm -hmm. believe it. Um, it's It really is the color of like a beautiful summer sunrise, a pink and blue and all these lovely colors. And when you see that thing at the garden center, it's just irresistible. It is irresistible and fully adaptable to blue. This past year, we had a blue show where we talked about how blue is so desirable in the landscape. And this hydrangea really checks that box. Right. A lot of people don't realize that a hydrangea's ability to be blue is inherent. Yes, it does depend on the soil chemistry. You need the soil to be acidic. You need the soil to have uh, aluminum in it. But Hydrangea also has to be able to turn blue in the first place, and that's where Let's Dance Skyview really excels. I get a little blue in the winter time, but that's a whole other subject. So let's talk about some flowers. Annual of the year, Supertunia Vista Jazzberry. Now, I love the Supertunia Vista series. It's incredible to me. As Kevin Hurd would say, it's a 200-mile-per-hour plant because, again, I go back to petunias in the old days when I was in the garden center industry and the deadheading and all that kind of stuff. This plant is so floriferous. Many times you can't even see the foliage. It has so many blooms on it. Now, when you take jazzberry, Supertunia Vista jazzberry, the 2024 annual plant of the year, and you combine it with a new introduction this past year, a picote um, uh, petunia, Supertunia hoopla vista orchid, and you put those two together, wow, it's quite something else. Yeah, hoopla is is getting a ton of press, but mm -hmm. it is not the, the uh, flower of the year. It's not mm -hmm. the annual of the year. That is jazzberry. And, you know, you're right. And I'm really glad that you brought up the Vista Supertunias because they really, that whole approach really goes hand in hand with what we were just talking about, the hydrangea, with the Let's Dance hydrangeas. Both of these plants really sort of turn the conventional wisdom about the plant on its head. Yes, exactly. You know, like you said, Petunia used, used to be thought of as this very fussy thing that you constantly had to deadhead and they were making a mess. And if you didn't trim them, you know, they got white fly. They were, they were kind of a nightmare. It's kind of amazing that they were even tolerated mm -hmm. because they were not great. And then along comes this Vista series and it has been developed to not set seed. So you don't have, you know, a bunch of uh, energy going into seed production. And as a result, it's not just like it flowers a little more. I mean, it is a flowering machine. Unreal. It's, it's uh, amazing. I'll, I'll give you one of my quotes on the plant. If you give it sun, water, and fertilizer, they're like a driverless car. Just keep blooming their heads off. That, you know, that's a very good uh, analogy. That is yeah. what they're like. But the fertilizer is key because when you have something yes. that has that ability, you got to keep it gassed up, as it were, exactly. or charged up, however you want to think about it. <laughs> well said. And, uh, of course, Kevin Hurd also said it's all about pedal substance. So you mm. get hot weather, you get rain, it stands up to it, keeps going. 
Caladiums, I love Caladiums, the Heart to Heart series, Lemon Blush Shade Caladium, the Caladium of the Year, a Shade Caladium. Now, there are many Heart to Heart Caladiums that are now considered sun or shade and adaptable as houseplants. And that's really exciting for me, Stacy, to see Caladiums that we can grow in the sun. I mean, I love caladiums. Unfortunately, so do the deer. So therefore, I do not grow caladiums. Um, but yeah, there's such an instrumental plant, in, especially in warmer climates. You know, it's a nice to have for us. But in hotter climates, they are absolutely essential because they do need plants that brighten up the shade and maybe can take some sun for those morning, you know, sunny mornings. And I think caladiums are so beautiful. And another plant that's just turning the conventional wisdom on its head. They're not just this, you know, green thing with some white speckling. I mean, the, the proven winners caladiums have the most outrageous and unique color combinations that I have ever seen. Heart to heart and uh, doesn't require a flower to provide you color. And that's the great thing. They do flower though. About caladiums. They do flower. But most people don't even but really realize them it. For the foliage. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Let's get to the perennials. I mean, that perennial plant of the year, pink profusion perennial salvia it's a clump forming reblooming pink salvia and i what i love about this one too is it's hardy to zone three attracts bees butterflies hummingbirds what's not to like about that plant you know salvia is such a valuable perennial and i think so many people they get a may night you know which is one of the most popular yep. conventional varieties of salvia and they go okay yeah well that's good enough you know, and they, they don't think like, whoa, this plant is such a great performer. It's deer resistant. It's flowering so much. I wonder if there's other colors. And so a plant like Pink Perfusion really starts making people think, whoa, there's something beyond this. And I can enjoy, you know, this amazing flower power, sun tolerance, deer resistance, drought tolerance. It's really got it all. I love them. Yeah, you bet. And of course, as I've always said, pink plays well in the garden. So yeah. adding Pink Perfusion Perennial salvia, the perennial plant of the year. The landscape perennial of the year. I know you'll like this one, Stacy. Storm cloud, blue star, amsonia. Oh, yes. Deer resistant, hardy to zone four, beautiful blue flowers. Great choice. I adore amsonia. I have all sorts of different types in my garden, including storm cloud. I do have a bunch of that. It has the black stems. Yes, so it looks exactly. really, really beautiful. When it's I mean, coming out of the ground in spring. Yeah. Cool. And, you know, you're talking about blue flowers. Everyone says, oh, there's no blue flowers that I can grow. Well, Amsonia is a plant that is extremely durable and easy for pretty much anyone to grow. So if you want some blue flowers, you can't cut them. It does have like a milky milkweed kind of substance. It's related to milkweed, but in the garden, it's beautiful. You bet. Hosta of the year. Well, the hosta of the year is Shadowland, Hudson Bay. So it's a really showy, attractive tricolor leaves. Uh, uh, hosta with really heavy substance. Uh, so that's your hosta of the year, Shadowland, Hudson Bay. But envelope, please, flowering shrub of the year, Stacy Wine and Spirits with Jilla. Wow, that's, uh, that's quite a plant. And I love the plant, not just for its blooms, but for its foliage. And that's another Megan Matai introduction. Mm -hmm. So Wine and Spirits is another one of her masterpieces. And so, you know, the the flowering shrub of the year is sort of our catch-all. So we have a hydrangea of the year, we have a rose of the year, we have a landscape shrub of the year, which we'll be discussing in Plants on Trial. But the flowering shrub of the year is sort of like, we're obviously not going to have a Wygela of the year. I mean, how much farther can we really take this whole of the year thing? <laughs> so that's kind of like when something's not going to be a hydrangea or go into one of those other categories, we use it, we highlight it in this flowering shrub of the year. So Wine and Spirits Wygela is like Wine and Roses, which mm -hmm. of course is the plant that kind of put our original brand color choice shrubs on the map. That nice dark black purple foliage, but with white flowers instead of the pink. Now the pink is gorgeous. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love it. Mm -hmm. But there's something about the contrast of the white flowers and that dark purple foliage. And I would say that the foliage on Wine and Spirits is much blacker and darker than Wine and Roses. You know, just as we've worked with more plants and, and brought more of those qualities out. Um, it is stunning in it the is. garden and uh really just the white just adds such a nice touch it's one of those plants that if you've got it in your yard and it's blooming you're gonna have people going what is that and we'll talk more about it in this coming year because stacy i agree and with the beautiful white blooms and the dark foliage in the evening or at nighttime mm. it's like stars it's it's just gorgeous rose of the year oh so easy peasy we've talked about that before i love the oh so roses and they're so floriferous i 
really don't have to add to that. You talk about disease resistance and blooming your head off. Oh, so easy peasy. And uh, like you said, Stacy, we're going to talk about the landscape shrub of the year, which I'm very excited about uh, coming up in plants on trial. And then let me quickly mention envelope, please. House plant of the year, mythic dragonite allocation. Now, I love allocations because the foliage is incredible. And I have found with tropical plants that this is a plant which really came on the radar for people over the past few years as a very desirable houseplant. Yeah, and very easy to grow. Easy to grow. Gotta love that. So alocasia, mythic dragonite. Okay, landscape shrub of the year is going to be our plant on trial coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It is time where we put a plant on trial. It's to say you get to decide if you're going to put it in your garden or not. And as Rick said, today's plant on trial is indeed the landscape shrub of the year, one fizzy, mizzy idea. But before I dive into that, I do want to briefly address how the shrubs of the year are picked. Okay. Because we probably have listeners going out there going, house plant of the year? Well, says who? Shrub of the year? <laughs> well, says who? And so I wanted to kind of give you a, a quick little bit of background into that. So for shrubs, we actually have our licensed growers, which are some of the largest growers across the U.S. and Canada. They actually get to vote. Uh, we give them a couple of options of what we think will be good based on, you know, what we're hearing from people out there. And it's their votes that determine what will be our hydrangea of the year, rose of the year, flowering shrub of the year, and landscape shrub of the year. Um, our partners over at Walters Gardens do something similar, but they actually ask all of their customers and a bunch of other industry people to vote on their perennial of the year. And it works similarly with annuals, caladiums, and, uh, of course, uh, houseplant of the year as well. I mean, we can't just open it up for anything because there's got to be supply. We've got to make sure that, you know, whenever everyone gets all excited about these plants, we've got enough of them on the market sure. that no one's left empty handed. Um, but we do, it's not just us sitting around going, hmm, let's make this the shrub of the year. <laughs> Throw a dart at <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. You know, we do get input from our growers. And of course, we, uh, we want these to be plants that people will be successful for, with, which is really the foundation of the entire Proven Winners brand. Stacy, it's great. It's like uh, in sports where uh, all stars are voted by their peers. That's exactly what it's like. And you're on a uh, roll they today. say, "Hey, you're the best of the best." Yeah, I mean, you know, I, you're, you were good enough to make the team. Yeah. So now we're gonna like pull out the All Star League. So uh, we have been doing shrubs of the year for a couple of years now. So you'll see that on plant tags as you are out shopping, even if it's no longer a shrub of the year, you'll still see that it had been. Um, but that brings us to the landscape shrub of the year. Now we talked uh, about wine and spirits, the flowering shrub of the year. Now landscape shrub of the year is a category that we use for plants that of course are beautiful and totally worthy of your home landscape. But these are plants that are especially suitable to professional landscapers mm. because professional landscapers, you know, they have slightly different needs than those of us who are just gardening at home. They need to be able to find things easily and in quantity for big jobs. They need plants that are reliable and tolerant of the various conditions because a landscaper puts in a big job, but after that, you know, any number of things could happen. And of course it needs to be something that's like reasonably familiar to landscapers because they don't have the time to do all of the research if we were to introduce something like El Nino Chitalpa. Beautiful plant, absolutely worth planting in the landscape. But if you've got a landscaper who's busy and is just like, I don't have time to right. deep dive into what a Chitalpa is and why this is a good plant for me, we want that immediate name recognition. And so that's where Fizzy Mizzy Itea comes in. And Itea, I think, has had kind of an unlikely uh, journey to the landscape and garden trade. Um, it's an, it is a native plant. So um, it's uh, frequently called Virginia Sweet Spire. Itea virginica is the botanical name, so that's where the Virginia part comes in, and it is indeed native to Virginia, as well as pretty much the entire southeast uh, coast, all the way down to Florida, all the way over to Texas, and then all the way up into southern Illinois and Indiana. So it's not native to Michigan, but um, through most of the lower Midwest and southeast and central U.S. And um, it, it, so it, 
native plant, people recognize it. If it's blooming, it will certainly be recognizable because that name sweet spire comes from its flowers, which are long spire shaped racemes of flowers, very fragrant. So if you were hiking in the woods and an idea was in bloom, you would definitely know it. Um, but, but the great thing here, Stacy, is I'm familiar with IT ideas that have kind of drooping flowers. This one looks very different. Right. So what makes Fizzy Mizzy different is that its flowers point straight up yeah. like a true spire instead of dangling down. Now, they are beautiful combined, but that's that ability for the plant, the flowers to point straight up is where the name Fizzy Mizzy comes from oh. because it looks sort of like you just opened a bottle of Coke and all the fizz is coming up from the bottom. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's that's where the name comes from. Not and when you, when you see a plant in bloom, and you can see fl uh, pictures of Fizzy Mizzy Itea in our show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, um, yeah, that's that's where the name came from. Yeah, makes sense. So, so Itea... Like cracking open a 7-Up yeah, And, you know, all the ginger. bubbles come yeah, up, yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, Itea was, you know, sort of not really a popular plant until a variety called Henry's Garnet was yes. selected. And did you know that variety was selected in 1985? Wow. I, I believe it because I'll tell you what, I have been promoting ideas for years to people to plant in their yards, primarily because I've been trying to get people to stop planting burning bushes for fall color because yeah. this plant, the fall color is amazing. The fall color is amazing. And unlike a burning bush, you get flowers and fragrant flowers and it's not invasive like a lot of burning bushes are very invasive and so, the foliage doesn't drop off immediately immediately the foliage tends to hang on so great for all the seasons and i think that the foliage in my opinion and i, I would suspect yours as well rick um is much more handsome much more appealing than a burning I bush agree. it's leathery it's glossy so Henry's Garnet was a variety that flowered more than conventional Itea, um, had a better habit. And so Mary Henry, a native plant enthusiast, going back to 1985, which just goes to show you that native plant gardening may be trendy, but it is certainly not new. She selected that. It was introduced by Woodlanders Nursery, a wonderful nursery that is still in business today, selling all sorts of interesting native plants and other plants as well. And that kind of got the whole industry interested in ITEA mm -hmm. and brought us to Little Henry ITEA, which we introduced way, way back when we were just color choice shrubs before we joined with Proven Winners. And that was a dwarf form of Henry's Garnet. Now, the important thing about that is that ITEA, for all of its good qualities, like we said, it's native, flowers, gets great fall color, fragrant, so it attracts pollinators, tolerant of shade, tolerant of wet soil. I mean, it's really just a great, great plant. One potential liability, however, is that if you live in the colder end of its zone, which is about USDA zone five or possibly even six, it often got winter damage. Oh. Um, so even though it's hardy, the plant will survive. It, you know, some of that, especially if it has more tender growth towards the end of the season, older varieties, bigger varieties could get some winter damage. And because it blooms on old wood, so if you have an idea, it has its flower buds for the summer right on it right now. Any winter damage would take off those flowers on older, bigger varieties like Henry's Garnet. So when little Henry comes along and it's a small, compact, petite variety, that means in those colder climates, it's very often covered by snow when the coldest part of the of the winter hits. So it's less likely to get that damage. And that was really, it's not just that it's a space saving plant, it is, but it also has this ability to actually bloom and thrive in colder climates where bigger varieties that would be above the snow line wouldn't be able to. Mm, that's great. It's a great idea is uh, is what this plant is. And Stacy, uh, one of the things that I love about the plant, and let me ask you this, aside from winter, shade. I'm always looking for flowering shrubs for the shade. This one's uh, this one seems to work in the shade. You know, it's it's a huge issue for people who have a lot of shade. Uh, a lot of times they can feel like they don't have a lot of options, but this is one that will not just live in shade, but will actually bloom pretty well and get some good fall color. Now, the more sun it gets, the more blooms you're going to have, the more vivid sure. and attractive that fall color is going to be. But even if you have very deep shade, this is a plant that you can not just grow, but also enjoy. And I think that's so important that, that there are those options. That's fantastic. So Stacy's talking about fizzy mizzy 
idea. And if you're in your car listening to the podcast, listening to the radio version of our show, uh, and not watching on YouTube, uh, the spelling is I T E A. You may be scratching your head thinking, what are they talking about? <laughs> it's that simple. I T E A. Yes. Simple name. I'm glad you said that because people, because personally, I prefer Itea to Virginia Sweet Spire. I mean, yeah. that's a mouthful. Uh, and you, people probably did think you were saying idea. So that, I'm glad you clarified that. Um, it's also tolerant of wet soil. Very wet, even standing water, okay. um, or at least partially stand. You know, if it's if it's if it's very wet at times. So I wouldn't plant it like in a pond, but if it's an area that floods occasionally, this is a great choice. And the wetter the soil, the better the plant is going to do. I can't grow it at all in my very dry, uh, non-irrigated garden. Um, but yeah, if you have wet soil, clay soil, this is a great plant. So it's a problem solver. It's also deer resistant. And I do want to add that fizzy mizzy. So it has these upright standing flowers that look like you just opened a bottle of soda and uh, it's also in that smaller range so it reaches two to three feet tall and wide so it is also one of those that is typically going to be covered in snow when you have that really really cold weather that would take out a taller idea so if you live in a cold climate it's a great choice if you are planting in a more exposed area it's a great choice because it's going to be, again, closer to the ground. So I, I would recommend a good layer of mulch. That's not just going to help with the winter survival, but also with its water needs because this is not a drought-tolerant plant. As many plants that are tolerant of very wet conditions are, it really won't tolerate the opposite. So that's not uncommon here in the horticulture world. It's a special plant. It's going to be abundant in the marketplace coming up this spring because it is the landscape shrub of the year. You can find out more about it at Gardening Simplified on air.com or go to our Instagram channel or our YouTube channel for lots more pictures. Uh, we're going to take a little break. And when we come back, we're opening up the gardening mailbag. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show, where we try to simplify gardening for you, as well as share our opinions about gardening and plants, and we have opinions. Mm -hmm. And we're happy to share them with you if you have a question for us. And you won't just get our opinion, you'll also get our experience and knowledge uh, and information that you can use in your garden. Uh, and so we invite you to write to us if you have a gardening question, help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, or just visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and click the contact tab. You can send us a message there. YouTube, Instagram, we all work together. So wherever you reach out to us, we'll hear your question and we will try to answer it. Now, last week, uh, we had a bunch of listener resolutions, which was great. I loved hearing from everybody. And if you didn't get a chance to listen in, um, we pasted all those resolutions into the show notes so you can read them there at your leisure. Um, but uh, we have our first question from Ryan. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, given the weather that we have this week, I'm, I'm feeling a little guilty that we did not get to Ryan's question last oh, week. Oh, yes. So well, uh, let's hear what Ryan asked. <laughs> it's doable. But uh, hey, and by the way, let me mention, uh, we talked about ITEA. And it popped into my head that those listening on radio may have thought we were talking about IKEA. And Stacy, that plant requires no assembly, right? Uh, no, it does not. Right. I T is in Thomas E A. Not there you go. <laughs> Ryan said so. We randomly received 100 tulip bulbs in the mail. Have no idea where they came from or what to do with them. With the mild temperatures, can we get away with planting them now? Or do we need to wait until next fall? Ryan, I have done this often throughout my life. I have used a pickaxe to cut through the frost and dig down 12 inches deep and plant tulips. Put on some warm clothes and plant them. Well, you know, Ryan, if we had gotten to your question last week when it was still mild and there was no snow, uh, this probably would have been a much more appealing proposition than it's going to be right now. But first, I have a question back to Ryan. You randomly received 100 tulip bulbs. I, yeah. want, I want a friend who, who randomly sends me 100 tulip bulbs. <laughs> Although, That's great. you know, it did remind me of that story that hit, I think it was during COVID, about how people were receiving random packs of seed seeds from China. Yes. And people were planting them, which seems crazy to me. But it a tulip crazy. bulb is a little less risky, I think. So... Ryan has random tulip bulbs. If we had answered your question last week, we had a week in the 40s. It was warm. You would have easily been able to plant them. And, but the bottom line is that 
the fall planting of bulbs is not like if you do it any time outside of that, they won't live. It's really about the ideal time to plant so that the bulb will put on roots exactly, and be ready to flower in spring. It's kind of, you know, in sync with the, the changing light and the temperature. So what that fall planting does is, again, give it the longest possible time to grow roots so that when spring comes, it's ready to grow. But it's not like a do or die situation. No, I agree. Ta uh, Ryan, take one of the 100, sacrifice one, take a sharp knife, cut it in half. You'll see that flower, that potential inside the bulb. The bulb has everything it needs in order to bloom next spring. Right. Like Stacy says, it's just optimum to get them. So plant them a little deeper, but plant them, Ryan. Don't wait until next week. Well, plant them if you can. Um, if we do end up having as much snow as they are potentially calling for here in West Michigan. Uh, I'll you come <laughs> over and help. It's a okay. blast. All right. You can reach Rick at, uh, but I do want to say if you cannot get them in the ground, if there really is so much snow and it's frozen, um, I would not save them. You know, they're yeah. not going to, they're Agreed. not going to, save well they're going to dry out and they're going to not live Agreed. so i would instead recommend that if you can't get them in the ground get round up a bunch of containers they can be plastic nursery pots whatever pot them up in potting soil just whatever potting mix you have in the garage or you can get from whatever uh, garden center is nearby pot them up water them put them outside to get the cold treatment you want them to have at least six to eight weeks of cold temperatures, and then you can bring them inside to flower. You can let them flower outside and plant them in your containers with some pansies, but I definitely would not say them. I'd either get them in the ground if you can, get them in containers outside if you can't, and just don't let them go to waste. You got surprise tulips. Stacy, uh, I would recommend for Ryan, he uses the search engine of his choice and just look up bulb forcing, All right, bulb yeah. forcing. There you go. Kurt writes, hi, Stacy and Rick. I garden in England, zone 8A, and I've had so much rain. Pretty much the entire garden's flooded after rainstorms we've had this last week. I'm scared all my plants are going to rot. I sent in some photos the other day to show you the proven winter shrubs I had, but the situation has gotten worse now. Will the garden survive, or am I going to have to start all over again next spring? Maybe you could do a show about plants and their resistance to floods. Which is interesting, because we also had a, a question this past week if we could do a show on drought tolerance. Exactly. So <laughs> everybody's dealing with something different. So uh, Kurt did send a photo, which we will put in the show notes or on the YouTube version. And ouch is all I have to say oh, really? about Kurt's photo. Yeah, it is not pretty wow it's like a, a little mini lake there in in his backyard i just wet my plants <laughs> and um i so i would not give up on the plants yet um but the thing is that flooding in winter is definitely much worse on the plants than flooding in summer now flooding great. in summer is no picnic Correct. that's not great either however what happens in summer is that when the plants have foliage on them, that foliage is giving off water vapor. So it's able to sort of take that water, if it can stay alive, if the roots aren't completely suffocated, and sort of off-gas that and, make, and, and deal with it a little bit better. Of course, the sun is also helping to evaporate water. When you have standing water like this in winter, there's really nothing. The plant is dormant. It's not metabolizing. So all you have is those roots and all of the... Um, air spaces that were full of oxygen are now full of water. So it is definitely not ideal. Now, he is in England, so a mild climate. They're not getting any freezing. I did write back to Kurt and recommend that he try to carefully dig the plants. Normally, you would want to avoid digging in very wet soil, but I think that without that, there's just no way these plants are going to survive. So I said, if you got a pair of waders or some muck boots or something and can get out there and gently, carefully lift the plants, Get them into a potting mix. I have found that that works well. Um, something that's going to get uh, air to those roots. Um, pot them up. Let them recover there. Wait until spring. I mean, I wouldn't write anything off until mm -hmm. spring comes Agreed. and things start to leaf out. Um, so it's not great, but I would. Tr I think it's worth taking the measures. And I would also say that even if you're having extreme weather, overall, I don't think that it bodes well for this particular spot. For most shrubs, I mean, you can plant nitea there. It can it can take the wet soil. But he also sent me a list of plants that he had. It's not in this particular question. Something like a panicle hydrangea will not 
tolerate that wet soil at all. So um, if this if this area is prone to flooding, I would rethink what you're planting there and take the stuff that you have planted, again, pot it up to get it through the rest of winter and find a new place that's more suitable for it for spring. And then maybe have a New Year's resolution like Stacy's New Year res, uh, New Year's resolution about grading. Regrading right? the yard, yeah. Trying to <laughs> slope some of that water away. Good luck to you, Kurt. Randy wants to know what's wrong with his arborvitae, and he sent in a picture of a very tall, well-established hedge. One of the plants in the foreground of the picture has large brown portions, so what's going on? Stacy? this is a dilemma throughout the years uh, for me when somebody comes up to you and has a row of plants, but one of them is a troublemaker. Why is one struggling or turning brown or dying and the other one's okay? It's always a mystery. It Well, there's so many reasons why. Exactly. There's so many possible reasons why. You know, it can be a matter of the direction of the wind. There can be things like underlying bedrock or something buried from back when your house is being constructed. Um, it can be due to a pet or a nearby animal favoring that particular plant over others. So this this plant uh, for Randy is on the end of the row, mm -hmm. um, and that can even be for something like an herbicide drift. If you have a neighbor who has a lawn service, and then small particles of herbicide can go into the air and land on the plant. I mean, there's, it's one of those things that, like, it's a big picture thing. It can be very hard to determine. But looking at Randy's picture, um, which we will, like, of course, put in the show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, my suspicion is arborvitae leaf miner. Okay. And arborvitae leaf miner. Now, if you know what a leaf miner is, if you've ever grown columbine, you know what a leaf miner is. Columbine, very susceptible to leaf miners, not detrimental, looks a little funky, but not really too bad for the plant. But it's an insect. It can be a moth. It can be uh, different types of, of insects. And it literally, they lay the egg in it, and it, the leaf miner larva literally burrows between the two layers of the leaves of the leaf and eats all of that tissue in there. Now, if you've ever seen an arborvitae foliage, you might be thinking, how in the world is a leaf miner going to, to do that? But you can look at p pictures of them online. Quite a fascinating insect, I think. Uh, but the the damage of arborvitae leaf miner when they really get established is very much looks like what Randy is sure. seeing. Okay. So if it is arborvitae leaf miner, it's a well established issue that, and I wouldn't be surprised in this case since it is a moth. They just have easy access to that end plant, and they're like, "Hey, we're happy here." Now they will eventually probably start to spread to the other plants in the hedgerow, but um, that's my suspicion. Again, I, I would need to see the foliage up close to say for sure. Um, this is a great opportunity for you to contact your cooperative extension if you know of that and they can diagnose it for you from actual samples. Um, but that is my suspicion based on uh, knowing, seeing a lot of arborvitaes with leaf miner in my time. I think you're right. And you're right that you have to do detective work. Yeah. I mean, this plant is right outside the door of what looks like a shed, a tool shed, and uh, there's a bag of fertilizer off to the side Maybe something got spilled in that yeah. one plant, but uh, you're probably right. I think uh, I would go down that road. Yep. So uh, if you have any questions, again, you can reach us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We're going to take a little break. When we come back, we've got branching news, so please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news, and today in branching news, we'll focus on trends and we got to start right off the top with congratulations to proven winners, Color Choice Shrubs, Pugster Amethyst Budlia, a proven winners Color Choice variety, has earned the 2024 Flower of the Year Award from the Japan Flower Selections Association, the JFA. In the most recent judging, uh, 61 varieties were selected as award winners, and from those, one plant in each category receives the top uh, award, Flower of the Year. Pugster Amethyst Budlia won top honors in the garden plant category. A standard for good flowers is the motto of the JFA, and it expresses its confidence that uh, Pugster Amethyst will uh, live up to the billing. And Stacy, uh, I can tell them, uh, rest assured, it will. What a, what a gorgeous plant. 
It is. I, I, I appreciate you saying that. And of course, we appreciate uh, them saying that as well, because I mean, obviously, we think our plants are pretty great, but mm-hmm. it always means a lot when someone else comes along and recognizes it. And, you know, flowers play such a hugely central role in Japanese life, yes. Japanese culture. And so, you know, knowing that a culture like that, that just really prioritizes flowers and plants in all aspects of life to recognize one of our plants, it really is a huge, huge honor. And, uh, it's good to know we're big in Japan. I couldn't have said it better. I love the people in Japan and, uh, you know, they just have such a, a love for horticulture. Oh it's, yeah. It's amazing. And when you talk hydrangeas, it's synonymous with, uh, uh, with Japan. And in this case, a Budlia, uh, amethyst Budlia pugster. Uh, and I suggest you plant it in your landscape. Also the Pantone color of the year is peach fuzz. Yay! Peach fuzz, an appealing peach hue, softly nestled between pink and orange. That's what I always think of when I see peach. It's like, is it pink? Is it orange? No, it's kind of pink and orange. Best of both worlds. Best of both worlds, exactly. A warm and cozy shade, highlighting our desire for togetherness with others or enjoying a moment of stillness and the feeling of sanctuary that it creates. But it causes me to think of uh, two proven winners, color choice shrubs that I love for this color. One is double take peach. Perfect. When Perfect that choice. blooms, wow, and thornless, right? Yeah, it is a thornless uh Quince and very important in Japan as well. Very much treasured throughout Asia, but especially Japan. So I love that. And then, of course, uh, the fragrant, disease-resistant at last rose. Mm. At least, I don't know if you look at it that way, Stacey, but I view that as a peach rose. Yeah, I would say that's a peach rose. Yep, as is our new flavor at Honey Apricot, our edible rose. Okay. With Honey Apricot flavored petals. Yum. (laughs) Yum. See, you got to practice what you peach. That's what you got to do. And uh, this is the trend uh, this year, according to Pantone, the color peach fuzz. I can see it in clothing already. People will be out there on the beach in their one peach bathing suits. Uh, But you do have to practice what you peach. As a matter of fact, I created a limerick to celebrate peach fuzz, the decor world all abuzz. It's what a trend usually does. As a figure of speech, this one is a peach appealing and covered in fuzz. Now, somewhere in between orange and pink, peach is the colorful sink. More than nutritious, it's downright delicious when added to a drink. This development I find to be pivotal. A fruit and color so mythical. And so for a grown, I say to peach their own. That peach pun was downright pitiful. There you go. (laughs) Celebrating peaches. (laughs) Yeah, I think that was a juicy one. All right. One of the world's top 10 food and beverage flavor manufacturers has identified the official 2024 flavor of the year as Ube. No, not eBay. Ube. U-B-E. It's a bright purple tuberous root hailing from the Philippines, and it's gained international recognition as being put into dishes to give us that great purple color. Like a lot of people love the purple potatoes. Uh, Those are a lot Mm -hmm. of fun to make with food. Puts a lot of color on the plate. So uh, that's it. The um, flavor of the year, ube, spelled U-B-E. You know, if you have ever been to an Asian bakery, you will see baked goods made from ube, and you'll think that they've been made with some, you know, ghastly food additive. But no, it's the actual, <laughs> yeah, it's it the actual glows. color. Yeah, it's it's a wild color yeah. to see. Yeah, that's great. So, Stacy, uh, the next trend uh, that I want to share, and it's something that's personal for me because it's what I cook for breakfast, Ooh. and had it for breakfast this morning, by the way. And for our YouTube view- viewers, I'm going. It's show and tell time. I'm going to set it right there on the table. Buckwheat. Oh, have you had buckwheat? So I, I guess now that I've seen this, I have a question: Is all cream of wheat buckwheat? No. Oh, it's not. But it's an ancient grain. As a matter of fact, um, I'll make oat bran. Okay. Or you can make steel cut oats. But in this case, it's buckwheat, and it's it's basically one of these ancient grains that has found its time in the limelight. Of course, buckwheat is a, a gluten-free food. Uh, they use it as a cover crop. Of course, it supports pollinators and greater biodiversity. Uh, so buckwheat's kind of, yeah, lumped in that category of ancient grains. I think it's delicious, and it's, uh, it's very, very good for you. Uh, it's a stone ground ancient grain. 
had it for breakfast this morning. So I'm just telling you that on the radar for 2024, buckwheat is a plant that has found the spotlight. Well, I have had buckwheat as kasha. Okay. So it's like a whole grain, you know, sort of like you'd cook like, uh, I don't know, other whole like rice or something like that. Um, it's very commonly served in a Russian dish with uh, it's cooked. And then you put butterfly uh, pasta, bow tie pasta, oh. and saute the whole thing in butter, which probably negates some of the health effect, but tastes really great. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Well, I'm going to encourage people to give But it's not the ground. It's not the ground. So we're talking the sure. whole buckwheat groats there. Sure. But. Well, you know, they're always telling you to eat brand fiber or brand muffins, you know, and you got to kind of choke that thing down. You know, I have brand brandxiety. Brandxiety? Yeah, brandxiety. That's a good pun for you. Uh, but uh, yeah, buckwheat, give it a try. All right, everything's better in the open air. Everything is better even in fitness training if you are in open air. And of course, also uh, gardening. So uh, I'm seeing a lot of trending here where uh, individuals are insisting on the benefits for the brain, mental health, cognitive performance by exercising outdoors. Of course, this is the time of year when we all hit the gym, uh, but uh, trying to get some of that physical activity outdoors, they have found that the neurological benefits are amazing when you exercise outdoors outdoors and i kind of tie that into gardening also you know when you're out there shoveling weeding whatever it may be and you're in the fresh air i think you get the double the benefit with exercise when you're in the fresh air that's true and it, it's much more enjoyable than you know a bunch of stale gym air with the news shouting at you or whatever <laughs> but i have to say you know my main form of outdoor exercise in the winter is indeed shoveling and um, I I hate winter and I hate shoveling. And when my Same husband here. looks over at me and says, isn't this great exercise? <laughs> I uh, unfortunately never have anything nice to say uh, in response to that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. Well, word of the day is Ninguid. And I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing this right, Stacey. It's spelled N-I-N-G-U-I-D. But ninguid is an ancient word that means a landscape covered in snow. Oh, I've never heard that word before. Yeah, I hadn't Interesting. either, and that's why I throw it in here. Ninguid, N-I-N-G-U-I-D, a landscape covered in snow. Uh, and we'll leave you with a couple trends to ponder. One, I'm seeing this all over the place. You mentioned it earlier, uh, Stacy. certainly drought tolerant plantings and it's not just california and arizona anymore here in the united states this is uh, something that's moved into the midwest as far as interest is concerned yeah. uh, and so that's a trend that we'll continue to look at and then the pennsylvania horticultural society uh, recommends planting more grasses and sedges which kind of ties into that whole drought tolerant issue also and i support that because i'm a huge fan of uh, ornamental ornamental grasses and sedges. I think they play a very important role in the landscape. So there you have it, Stacy. 2024 is off to the races. It sure is. And we want to thank you so much for tuning in to the Gardening Simplified Show. Thank you, Rick. Thanks to Adriana. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>